How does a human survive in outer space? Outside the protective shell of Earth's atmosphere lies an endless void of cold, black emptiness, an environment where no life, none as we know it at least, can be sustained. And yet human beings have stepped into that void with all of our infinite fragilities and we have lived to tell the tale. In fact, over hundreds of excursions into the cosmic vacuum across six decades of human spaceflight, and no person has ever died in space. So let's talk about the evolution of the spacesuit. This is the space race. So the basic idea for surviving an environment that is so far distant from the surface of the Earth is to bring as much of the Earth's environment along with you as you can. That means ambient pressure, air quality, and temperature all need to remain consistent throughout your journey. This is something that human beings began to discover long before spaceflight. In the year 1932, a Swiss physicist named August Picard decided that he would push the boundaries of the human experience and fly to a height of 16,000 meters or 52,000 feet in a helium balloon. Picard was smart enough to know that there was not enough atmosphere at that altitude for him to survive, so he built an aluminum sphere and pressurized it with compressed air. Anyone who has climbed a mountain or even just seen other people climb mountains on TV knows that as you get higher into the sky, the air becomes thin and it becomes much more difficult to breathe in enough oxygen. But an even more dangerous side effect of high altitude is the decrease in ambient pressure that happens as a result of the lower density in the atmosphere. The boiling point of a liquid is determined by two main factors, temperature and pressure. The lower the ambient pressure, the lower the temperature at which a liquid will convert to vapor. Human beings are made up mostly of liquids, and we like to keep it that way. At an altitude of 63,000 feet or 19,000 meters above sea level, the ambient pressure drops to a point where water can boil at just 37 degrees Celsius or 99 Fahrenheit, which is normal human body temperature. So at this point, it doesn't matter how much oxygen you have to breathe, without pressure, you're about to have a very bad day. So floating under a balloon in a pressure vessel is one way to do it, but what if you wanna push the boundaries in something with a little more control, like an airplane? Let's talk about Wiley Post, an American pilot who was the first person to fly solo around the world. He was a bit of a rogue and a daredevil, you can tell by the eye patch, and One-Eyed Willie built his own custom supercharged airplane named the Winnie Mae. This souped-up machine had the power to reach 15,000 meters in altitude, where Willie knew that he could ride the jet stream to travel even further and faster than ever before. His plane may have been up to the task, but he was smart enough to know that his body wasn't sturdy enough. So, Willie Post teamed up with the automotive tire makers BF Goodrich to craft the first ever pressure suit in 1934. The body of the suit had three layers, starting with long underwear on the inside covered by a black rubber air pressure bladder and an outer layer made of rubberized parachute fabric. The outer layer was glued to a frame with arm and leg joints that allowed him to operate the flight controls and to walk to and from the aircraft. Attached to the frame were pigskin gloves, rubber boots, and a scuba diver's helmet made from aluminum and plastic. Now, the first real pressure suits that weren't homemade by a one-eyed lunatic in a tire shop were done by the US Air Force. When the first high-altitude bombers were developed in the mid-1940s, giant planes like the B-36 Peacemaker were able to reach cruising heights over 40,000 feet, at which point an oxygen mask alone is just not enough to keep the crew functioning. And while the interior cabin of these planes were pressurized, just like a commercial airliner, this bomber was meant for active combat, and any damage to the outer shell would cause a rapid depressurization event, so the crew would need their own pressure suits with fully enclosed helmets. By the mid-50s, the US had developed their U-2 spy plane, an aircraft that could reach a staggering altitude of 21,000 meters or 69,000 feet above sea level, high above Soviet radar and missile capability. A new flight suit was developed for U-2 pilots that would maintain their body pressure throughout the mission and prevent their blood from boiling at the extreme altitude. By the late 1950s, the first ever space race had officially begun, with the United States and Soviet Union 
both developing the technology that would not only put a man into outer space, but also get him back home alive. That was actually the tricky part. The US Air Force started experimenting with ultra-high-speed, high-altitude flight in their X-15 rocket plane. In order to survive these hypersonic missions to the edge of the atmosphere, an even more advanced full-pressure flight suit was developed, the XMC-2. And this is where the modern image of the spacesuit really begins to take shape. Of course, we have been talking a lot about American technology here, but the first real spacesuit was worn by cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin aboard Vostok 1 as the Soviets claimed victory in the first leg of the space race, circling the Earth at a speed of 27,400 kilometers per hour on a 108-minute flight. Yuri's suit was critical to his survival on that mission because even though the capsule maintained pressure throughout the flight, the Vostok capsule was not able to land safely on the Earth, so the pilot had to bail out at an altitude of 23,000 feet and parachute the rest of the way down. After being officially formed in 1959, NASA set to work on developing their own spacesuit using the existing Air Force pressure suits as their template. The first innovation that NASA scientists brought to spacesuit design was to replace the outer covering of the Air Force suits with aluminized nylon for better thermal insulation, and they removed the rubber seals that isolated the helmet from the rest of the suit, pumping air in from the waist to help cool the suit through airflow. This was the suit used by the Project Mercury astronauts. Their flight plans were relatively simple, reach orbit and come back down again. The spacesuit was only there as a protective measure if the capsule lost pressure, but luckily, that never happened. It's not until Project Gemini where things get real for NASA. It's time to leave the capsule, and now the astronauts require a spacesuit that will actively keep them alive in the vacuum of space. Now, again, it's probably important to note that the Soviet Union also achieved the first spacewalk before NASA. On March 18, 1965, Soviet cosmonaut Alexei Leonov became the first person to leave a space capsule and float freely in orbit. This was a learning experience for the brand new field of human space exploration because no one had ever tried to use a pressurized suit in a total vacuum before. So what happened to Alexei was that his suit puffed up like a balloon, he was barely able to move, he couldn't even reach the shutter on his camera, and worst of all, the suit grew so big that he couldn't fit back inside the Vostok capsule. So Alexei had to vent his own atmosphere out into space in order to shrink down enough to squeeze through the airlock and back into the safety of his vehicle. Just two months later, it was NASA's turn to enter the void, and astronaut Ed White made the first American spacewalk. Ed had a much easier time on his execution. Instead of a bulky life support backpack like the Soviets, White was tethered to the capsule for life support, and NASA's upgraded spacesuit design for Gemini incorporated a mesh into the outer structure of the suit that prevented the ballooning issue. White maneuvered easily through the vacuum using a handheld air pressure gun that functioned like a control thruster. The mission was a resounding success. NASA would leverage the Gemini mission to learn as much as they possibly could about extravehicular activity in space as quickly as they could manage. President Kennedy had made the promise that Americans would walk on the moon before the end of the 1960s, and NASA wasn't about to let JFK's dream die alongside the man. So they pressed on towards the first lunar spacesuit, their most demanding task yet. The first major change for the lunar suit would be the need for a self-contained life support system. The tethering cable from the Gemini missions wouldn't cut it for exploring the moon, so the astronauts needed backpacks, big ones. Yet they still had to balance and move freely in a low-gravity environment. But even if they got the balance perfect, it was still likely that the astronauts were going to fall down on the moon, so the suit needed to be tough. A new material of woven silica fibers coated with Teflon was developed as an outer shell for the new suit. On the inside of the lunar suit, there was a tight-fitting system of bellows and mechanical joints that would give the astronauts full mobility while under pressure. The inner layer of the suit was plumbed with a network of cooling tubes that circulated water over the astronaut's body to remove heat. At Earth gravity, the suit weighed 35 kilograms plus another 60 kilograms for the backpack, which is a total of 209 pounds. 
This suit brought Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the surface of the moon, NASA's first real win in the space race, but it was a definitive victory. NASA used their experience with the Apollo mission to gradually improve on their spacesuit design as they went, but out of the 12 individuals to set foot on the moon, there was not one single issue related to their spacesuits. The promise of the space shuttle program was that human beings were now going to live and work in outer space on a regular basis, a sustained presence in low Earth orbit. And for that, we would again need an improved spacesuit design that could support long-duration spacewalks while exposed to the vacuum and the raw intensity of the sun. The Apollo suit was again used as the basis for the Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or EMU, that would be paired with the Space Shuttle. Because these suits were made exclusively for use in zero-g, they could be much heavier and more rigid than the Apollo designs. The EMU was created with a modular design, with each component made in a variety of sizes so that any astronaut would be able to piece together a suit to fit their body shape. The EMU also had the ability to equip a new jetpack design that allowed astronauts to float freely in outer space, untethered to their vehicle. Although this unit was eventually retired for just being a bit too dangerous to be worthwhile, these EMU suits were put to their ultimate test when the Hubble Space Telescope was deployed in 1990. The idea behind Hubble was that it could be served regularly by space shuttle astronauts to prolong the lifespan and functionality of the orbital platform. This would require long and complex spacewalks to be performed on Hubble, which orbits at a high altitude of 340 miles above sea level, about 100 miles higher than the ISS. In order to train for these spacewalks, NASA developed their Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. This is the pool of water that you see astronauts practicing in. Over the decades that the space shuttle operated, these EMU suits were steadily upgraded with enhanced safety features like a simple maneuvering thruster system, an upgraded battery, and improved heating in the glove section of the suit. These are the same suits that are used to this day for spacewalks on the ISS. There hasn't really been a significant redesign of the American spacesuit until now. On March 15, 2023, Axiom Space unveiled the long-awaited redesign of NASA's Extravehicular Mobility Units, a new spacesuit that would again take human beings to the surface of the moon on the Artemis III mission. The Axiom design was contracted out by NASA, who simply lacked the sources and funding in the modern era to design their own lunar suit. Axiom have essentially taken everything that was learned through the era of the EMU and the spacewalks conducted on the shuttle and ISS, then they packaged that technology into a suit that would give astronauts the mobility they required to operate on long-duration missions to the moon. What sets Artemis apart from Apollo is the new directive to establish a permanent presence on the moon. So instead of staying on the surface for a few hours and then coming home, Artemis crew members will live and work on the moon for weeks at a time. So this demands a spacesuit with a higher level of comfort and durability, combined with the mobility that is going to be required to literally build the first moon base. All that's left now is to imagine the future and the first spacesuit that will allow human beings to walk on the surface of Mars. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two.